Hello and welcome to a tutorial on regression-based test for moderation. My name is Brian Miller and I'll be guiding you through this tutorial. The objectives of this tutorial are sixfold. First, I'll help you differentiate between mediation and moderation, two terms that are commonly confused with each other, but they are decidedly different statistical concepts. Secondly, I'll help you differentiate between hierarchical and stepwise regression, two terms that are not at all the same thing, one of which is rarely recommended to be used. Three, I'll run and interpret some hierarchical regression in SPSS, but bear in mind that the regression output in SPSS would be very similar to that which might have been run on the same data in SAS or Stata or any of the other statistical software packages. So I won't walk through all the steps, but I will show you the output and we'll interpret it. Four, I'll compute some interaction terms and show you how to do that. Five, we'll mean center variables so as to help alleviate any concerns with multicollinearity, bearing in mind that mean centering is not the same thing as standardization. Sixth, we'll graph interactions, and I'll show you two different ways to do that. One, simply plug and chug into the regression formula, plot out four points, and connect the two pairs with line segments. Or, use some of the downloadable Excel spreadsheets that will automatically graph it for you, and I have a nifty one in mind. Moving on, our first objective again is to differentiate between mediation and moderation. So moderation is when a third variable affects the strength of the relationship between two other variables. I'll graph it in a second for you, but think about this. For example, the relationship between performance and salary may depend on gender. If you can ever make a statement like is contingent upon or especially if or depending upon some third variable, you're talking about an interaction effect or a moderator effect. And while it is against the law to actually discriminate in salary and other employment issues based upon gender, it's sad but true that we still find that oftentimes the correlation between performance and salary for men is different than that same bivariate relationship is for women. So for example, the relationship between performance and salary might be 0.7 for men, whereas it might be 0.4 for women. I don't know, I'm just making those numbers up. But the 0.7 versus 0.4 indicates that there is some third variable affecting the strength of that relationship. Now, more generically, it could be phrased as the relationship between x sub 1 and y is strong, especially if x sub 2 is also strong. So there I've substituted instead of depends on, I've substituted especially if. Again, another catchphrase to be aware of is contingent upon. Moving now to a mediator. Mediator is some third variable that acts as a generative mechanism between two other variables. So we can think of, in a very loose causal sense, x1 causing x2, which causes y. Bearing in mind, of course, the conditions for causality are very clear. But we would say, for example, that performance would mediate the relationship between job knowledge and salary. In essence, Job knowledge leads to or causes performance, and performance leads to or causes salary. So there we have a sort of a causal linkage thing. Again, bear in mind, I'm not saying that all mediators must be in a causal linkage. We sometimes think of them simply as an intervening mechanism by which the impact of one variable is transmitted to another variable. So let's look at these things diagrammatically. Here's the prototypical moderation diagram. Here you see that we have a predictor criterion relationship and we've graphed it so that the path from the moderator actually intersects or interacts with the relationship or the path from predictor to criterion. This is typically how it is displayed. However, as we'll find out in a little while, in order to effectively test for this interaction between a predictor and a moderator, we also have to include the main effect relationship between the moderator and the criterion, but we'll come back to that. Here's a typical mediation diagram. 
Here we have the predictor leading to or causing a mediator and some mediator leading to or causing a criterion. So there's sort of a causal linkage. X1 causes M, which causes Y, for example. Turning now to the second major objective of this tutorial, differentiating between hierarchical regression and stepwise regression. These are two very different things. Hierarchical regression is when you simply enter variables into an equation at various stages or blocks, or sadly, many software packages call them steps, thus perhaps the confusion between hierarchical and stepwise regression. But basically what we're saying is we can enter in some variables in the prediction of a Y or a dependent variable, an outcome, whatever it is you want to call it, criterion. We can then ascertain the total amount of variance explained in that criterion. And then in a second block, we enter in other variables or just one variable, if you will, and we assess the additional variance explained. Thus, we have some important statistics and tests associated with hierarchical regression. The first one is, of course, the change in R squared, often denoted as delta R squared, delta signifying change, of course. So this is the change in R squared from a block one of variables to a block two of variables. The additional incremental change in R squared has an associated statistical test with it, and that is the F-score. So we typically see this in the output as the change in F-score, or delta F. Now, of course, we also have an overall F-score for all of the blocks or steps of the variables entered into the regression equation. Now, on page 108 of Cohen and Cohen's 1983 classic textbook on correlation and regression, we will find that the, uh, before you can interpret the regression weights or the beta weights or the individual predictors, all terms that really mean the same thing, um, in any multiple regression, you have to have a significant omnibus F-score. That means there must be some overall significant impact. That is, the variance explained in Y must be significantly different from zero. And that variance explained in Y is the total variance explained by all of the predictors in block one and block two, or step one, step two, or stage one, stage two, whatever it is you want to call these particular variable entry stages. Now, we find that we'll use hierarchical regression when we want to uh, use control variables. Sometimes we'll control for certain demographic characteristics. Sometimes we'll simply statistically control for other variables that we know to be related with our outcome or our Y variable. Uh, perhaps previous research has found very conclusively time and time and time again that some predictor always predicts some significant amount of variance in some criterion. So we'll want to incrementally push back the frontiers of the nomological network, so to speak, and actually enter in those previously significant variables in a block and then enter in our own hypothesized substantive focal variables. Now, what we'll find in this tutorial is that we will use hierarchical regression to examine interaction terms. And so in a hierarchical regression using interactions, we would first include in stage one both the x1 predictor and the x2 predictor. That would give us, of course, an overall R squared. We would then enter into the equation in a second stage or block the cross product or the interaction of x1, x2, which is simply x1 times x2, and we will get an associated change in r squared. We'll get a new total r squared. We'll get a change in f score and a new total f score. Bear in mind that hierarchical regression is not the same thing as stepwise regression. Stepwise regression is when you enter in all the variables at one stage and then the software looks at every possible combination of variables and does this on your behalf. 
And there's various forms of stepwise. There's frontward and backward. But just for example, uh, the software may find the strongest bivariate relationship between a list of x1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 in the prediction of y. And let's just say, for example, that the strongest relationship is x1. So it'll enter in that one. And then it will enter in x2 by itself and see if there is a significant change and x3 by itself, and x4, and x5, and x6 separately by itself. It will also enter in x2 and 3, x2 and 4, x2 and 5, x2 and 6, x3 and 4, x3 and 5, x3 and 6, etc., 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 until it finds every possible combination that has a significant variance explained from each and every predictor variable so as to maximize the total variance explained. So if you have six predictors and three of them are completely unrelated to the criterion, you may find that some combination of the other three predictors will maximize the variance explained. The big problem here is that this capitalizes on the chance characteristics of this sample. The idea behind using samples to make inferences about a population and by using the statistical controls that regression allows for is that we want to be able to generalize from the sample we've analyzed to a larger population. If we're able to generalize to that larger population, we can also perhaps make generalizations towards other samples also selected from that randomization, uh, that uh, uh, particular population. So, if we use stepwise, we may find the three or so predictors that maximize variance explained in this sample. And if we ran stepwise on another sample that had, of course, different variable levels for each respondent in the sample, we might find a completely different set of predictor variables. So this is like throwing spaghetti at the wall just to see what sticks. This is not recommended and it's not even allowed by some journals. And there was a famous article in Educational and Psychological Measurement by Bruce Thompson, and I believe the title of it was, Stepwise Regression Need Not Apply Here. So that particular caveat suggests by trained psychometricians that this is not a very theoretical way of examining hypothesized relationships between variables. Well, let's look at the third objective now, running some hierarchical regression in SPSS. And again, you could run this regression in SAS or Stata or any other software package. But just for example here, for you SPSS users out there, here are some things, some click-through things that we would do when running this, uh, any particular regression data. Uh, first, we click on Analyze and then select Regression and then click Linear Regression. And we would choose DV1, for example, from a list of dependent variables, and we would select control one and control two as independent variables. Here's the important thing. With control variables, there really needs to be some sort of theoretical rationale for the control variables, not just to willy-nilly screen out things that you think might be important. Why is gender or why is age being used as a control variable? Hopefully, it's because previous research has found that those two variables are significantly related to whatever criterion we are examining. However, with control variables, there's never really a stated hypothesis about it. We focus our hypotheses on the focal relationships in our model, not on the control variables, which have hopefully been exhaustively examined in prior research. So, falling back to the SPSS click through there. We'd click on next and then we'd select our independent variables and then we click on statistics and since this is a um, uh, hierarchical regression, we want the software to pick the R square to calculate the R square change for us and then we click continue and click OK. Well that's going to give us some output that'll look just kind of like this. So let's examine this for a second. We can see that in the first table, we have model one and model two. The total variance explained in model one is 0 0.001. Well, that's hardly anything at all. And the F test associated with that 
is 0.046, which is far from significant. And of course, the F change up here is the same thing as the F overall from model one because it's the F change from nothing. So we would have 2 and 122 degrees of freedom, while here we have 2 and 122. Now, the focal variables included were two independent variables, and so now we have an overall model R squared of 0.452. That's 45% of the variance in our dependent variable is explained by these two variables and, to a negligible effect, the other control variables as well. So we have an overall F score that is statistically significant. We have a change in F, which is statistically significant. And we can now actually examine the regression coefficients in this output table. And what we see here is because the R squared change was nil and not significantly different from zero, it was zero, we will find that those two predictor variables in step one, that is control variable one and control variable two, have associated p-values of 0.878 and 0.805, not even near the threshold of being less than 0.05 to be determined as statistically significant, but we're not really interested in those anyway. What we're interested in is the impact of independent variable one and two in the prediction of DV1. So what we see is we have unstandardized regression coefficients. These are in the original metric of the scale. These happen to be Likert data one to five, but these are difficult to interpret. So we then actually look at the standardized beta coefficients here, the standardized regression weights, the betas, um, and that puts them on the same metric and we see that uh, we have IV1 is negatively related to the DV at negative 0.404, and IV2 is slightly stronger in its relationship or prediction of DV1, and both of them are statistically significantly different. Got it? Let's move on. What we need to do now is actually compute some interaction terms. Now that we've mastered hierarchical regression, now that I've given you a little bit of a heads up on the fact that we'll actually use hierarchical regression in moderation tests in multiple regression, let's take another quick peek at that diagram. So we're saying here that IV2 affects the relationship between IV1 and DV1. Since IV1 and IV2 will actually just be multiplied by each other to create some new artificial interaction term. The product of IV1 times IV2 is the same as the product of IV2 times IV1. So there could be anything in those ellipses. We could switch them. The ellipse on the far bottom left, IV1 could be labeled IV2. And IV2 could be labeled IV1. Mathematically, it doesn't make any difference. However, we often find that it's easier to phrase our hypotheses one way than the other, and we'll discuss that in a few minutes. But let's reconceptualize this diagram just for a minute here. And what we'll see is this is a, a, a typical sort of a, a experimental design thing where we have two levels of an independent variable, low and high, low and high. And so this is a two by two diagram. And if these were truly dichotomous variables where there was only a low score and a high score and they were not continuous variables, this would be a prototypical two by two factorial ANOVA. In the cell of the table, we have the dependent variable. So here we can look at these marginal terms and say that high levels of IV1 and high levels of IV2 will lead to the highest level of some DV low levels of IV1 and low levels of IV2 will lead to some low level of a DV, and high levels of one and low levels of the other will lead to some medium level of DV. So for those of you who have an experimental design background, that's really an interaction hypothesis. And we conduct those all the time using an ANOVA framework. However, most of the software for which we compute ANOVAs, has a built-in little checkbox that automatically calculates interaction terms because it automatically creates the cross product of the two independent variables. But if we're measuring continuous variables, 
Caution. Never dichotomize a continuous variable. Never cut them in half at the median. That is a major faux pas. This will result in the loss of huge amounts of useful information. This tends to treat scores that are close to each other as if they're actually far from each other. And I'll show you this on a normal bell curve plot on the next slide. But in ANOVA, we don't have to dichotomize since all the independent variables are categorical in ANOVA. They are group membership. 2x3, 4x3, 4x4, or as I just showed you, a 2x2. Two two. So we would have treatments and controls, and those would be the natural grouping mechanism. And so in ANOVA, the independent variables are always categorical. Now, Multiple regression completely subsumes ANOVA. Multiple regression completely subsumes t-test, all forms of correlation, ANOVA, ANCOVA, and a variety of other tests. Any test that you want to do in uh, using regression, I'm sorry, using uh, correlation or t-test or ANOVA or ANCOVA can be done in multiple regression, but there is a difference in the way we create the interaction terms in multiple regression. They are not automatically created for us. Let's take a quick look at the big problem with dichotomizing continuous variables. Here's a typical normal distribution. We have lots of scores near the middle, all accumulated underneath the bell curve, and they're evenly distributed. So what we have here is the dashed vertical line in the middle is the mean, the median, and the mode. And if you dichotomize continuous variables, you're treating observations with the score of 1 similar to observations with the score of 5. And you're suggesting that an observation with a score of 5 is very different from an observation with a score of 6. It's not. A 5 is much more like a 6 than it is like a 1. And a 6 is much more like a 5 than it is like a 10. So artificially dichotomizing continuous variables, for one, it will not allow for as sophisticated of a statistical test. And secondly, you lose tons of useful information. You lose the ability to make a fine-grained differentiation. So let's take a, another look at moderation effects here. So the strength of the relationship between an IV and a DV depends upon some moderator. So if one is low on the moderator and the correlation between IV1 and DV is different from the same correlation with those high on the moderator, that goes back to my example of, let's just say, for example, the moderator was a dichotomous category, gender, male, female, right? So we would say the correlation between IV1 and DV is different uh, for males than females, but... In multiple regression, we can also examine the moderators, or in this example, the IV2, as a continuous variable. So, in multiple regression, these correlations tend to manifest themselves as regression weights, or slopes of the lines. So, these slopes of the lines might be different if gender is our moderating variable. But, remember, gender or moderating variables in general are also IVs. So you must include both main effects in regression before including the interaction term. And that interaction term is simply the cross product of IV1 and IV2. So in a hierarchical regression, model one has both main effects but no interaction term. And then in model two or step two or block two or stage two, whatever it is you want to call it, you enter in the interaction term and the output will show you a model that has the main effect IVs and their cross product. So here's an example hypothesis. There's an interaction effect between IV1 and IV2 in the prediction of DV such that because we need to explain how these interactions play out, such that high levels of IV1 combined with high levels of IV2 will lead to higher levels of DV than will low levels of either 
or both of IV1 and IV2. If you think back to that little two by two box diagram I showed you a few minutes ago, that's exactly what this says. Now there are alternative ways of writing these sorts of interaction hypotheses. And here's a couple. The strength of the relationship between IV1 and DV depends upon IV2 such that IV1 is strongest when IV2 is high and weakest when IV2 is low. Or alternatively, you can phrase it as, there is a positive relationship between IV1 and DV, especially if IV2 is also high. Now, if we were to plot these hypotheses, and they all say the exact same thing, plot them out and collect, actually collect data and plot out the results, it might look something like this. Here we have on the vertical axis, the DV on the horizontal axis, one of the IVs, IV1. Now we have two line segments, a high IV2 and a low IV2. And actually, this really is kind of uh, dichotomizing this IV2, but for purposes of plotting interactions, we have to do that. And we'll see more about that later in this tutorial. But you'll notice that the red line and the green line are not parallel. If they were parallel, the low IV2 line, the green line, might be parallel, but just at a lower level. That is not an interaction. They don't have to be on the same line. They just have to be not parallel. So this is actually called a dis... Uh, I'm sorry, it's called a... Uh, a disordinal interaction because the lines don't actually cross. An ordinal, I'm sorry, this is an ordinal interaction. A disordinal interaction is one where the lines actually cross. So that might look something like this. There we have a completely crossed interaction and that's really interesting, especially as we seek to explain that in our results. So let's move on. Let's create those multiplicative terms here. We have to remember, of course, that most but not necessarily all IVs in regression are continuous. We can have independent variables for gender or um, hierarchical position in a company or manager versus non-manager or even a set of dummy variables for um, a one variable that has multiple categories like race or ethnicity. So, uh, or um, level of education, those things can all be uh, categories. But typically we like to use continuous variables in regression. It gives us much more uh, stuff to work with and uh, a richer uh, arena to in interpret the results. So for two independent variables, we'll simply create some third term that serves as the interaction. We will just go in and multiply both IVs. This is going to create a new variable in our data set. It'll be IV1 times IV2, or maybe whatever you want. The problem is that sometimes a new multiplicative term is collinear with one or both of its component parts. So collinearity simply means that two variables are sort of measuring the same thing. The prototypical cutoff is whenever two variables are correlated at 0.85 or higher, the absolute value of 0.85 or higher, we tend to have two measures of the same thing. For example, if I measured my height by measuring the distance from the floor to the top of my head, and I also measured it as the distance from the ceiling to the top of my head, and used both of those terms in some multiple regression, we'd find that if I'm a good measurer, we'd find that those two terms are almost perfectly correlated with each other. We'd have two measures of the same thing. We really don't want that. We want variables that measure different things. And so collinearity has some real problems in interpreting multiple regression. And we'll discuss that next. So the product of two variables is almost always collinear with its constituent parts. The IV1 times IV2 new variable is almost always collinear with either IV1 or IV2 or both of them. 
So when these two variables are so strongly correlated with each other, when these two predictor variables are strongly correlated with each other, they can affect how it is we interpret the multiple regression output. They can tend to make beta weights exceed plus or minus 1.0. Since a beta weight is a standardized regression coefficient, it is constrained to a range of negative 1 to positive 1. Beta weights of 0.9 are really, really strong beta weights. They're kind of proxies for semi-partial correlations, but in order to compare beta weights, you should probably use dominance analysis or relative weights analysis or something, because unless the variables uh, are on exactly the same scale, with exactly the same reliability and the exact same distribution, you can't actually significantly uh, examine differences between beta weights. But they're a nice little proxy that lets us know which is the stronger predictor. But when a beta weight is out of range, it's uninterpretable. And when both beta weights, both IV weights are out of range, it makes no sense whatsoever. So there's two ways to determine if you have collinearity. Tolerance or the variance inflation factor. Tolerance is actually just the reciprocal of VIF. So in your articles, you really only need to provide one or the other, never both. It's just redundant to provide both. So collinearity is indicated if a tolerance value is less than 0 0.10, that is somewhere between 0 and 0 0.10. Typically, you'll find them 0.8 or something higher. And then another way is if the variance inflation factor or the VIF is actually greater than 10. And uh, we don't want to see that either. Well, let's take a look at running some moderated multiple regression in SPSS. Again, the regression output would likely be similar, but uh, for you SPSS users, this is how you would actually run that uh, particular regression. So we'd go back in and use the dialog recall button or go back and click analyze regression linear and click reset. Let's just start with some new variables. We don't want to use those control variables anymore. So clicking reset removes them all. And then we'll choose DV1 as our DV. And that's the same DV we used in the previous example. And we'll also use IV1 and IV2 as IVs. They're entered into block one. Clicking the next button would then go in and insert the new interaction term that we had previously computed just by mathematically multiplying IV1 by IV2. And so we have this new term, IV1 x IV2. And so this is already created again, and this would be the only independent variable included in the second step or stage or block of the hierarchical regression model. Now, since we've clicked reset, we'll have to go back in and click statistics and also put another checkbox in that R squared change because we want to know the change from block one to block two. Block two, of course, has the interaction term in it. We want to know if that interaction term explains a significant incremental variance in the um, outcome variable. And we'll also put a checkbox in a new one there for collinearity diagnostics. Click OK. I'm sorry, we'll click Continue and then OK. We'll let's see what it looks like in output form. So here what we have is, going to the bottom table first, we have the two IVs in Model 1, Block 1, Step 1, Stage 1, whatever it is you want to call it. And up here we see that it's a significant F score. And here it's 0.451 R squared, that's 45% of the variance in the DV is explained by just IV1 and IV2. Well, that's really similar to what we found last time because those previous control variables didn't explain much. Now, what we also have is we have this cross product of IV1 and IV2, a new kind of an artificial variable that we've created, and we enter that into it, and we see that we have a, an F change of 15.296, which is statistically significant. The overall F score for all the variables in the final model is 42.428 with a statistical significance of less than 0 0.001, okay? Total variance explained of 0.513 up in the top table there. And then turning back down to the bottom table, 
we see that the F, uh, the cross product is also statistically significant. But guess what? We've got beta weights that are out of range. We can't have beta weights greater than the absolute value of one. Here we have a formerly within range independent variable one beta weight of negative 0.400 is now negative 1.15. Well, that doesn't help us too much. We also have an, a formerly significant beta weight for IV2 of negative 0.445. Now it's 0 0.2, negative 0 0.2151. And the interaction term is 2.048. And that doesn't allow us to interpret these regression coefficients. We can't ascertain which of them is the strongest predictor of some DV. And that's usually something we want to use multiple regression to, to provide us an answer for. What we'll see is that the significance levels will not change, but by making some adjustments to these terms, we'll bring the beta weights back into uh, range. And that would require some mean centering. And so mean centering variables reduces the impact of collinearity. This is not the same thing as standardizing variables. Standardization of variables requires that each observation score is subtracted from the mean of that variable and divided by the standard deviation of that variable. We don't do that with centering them. We simply subtract them from the mean of the variable. This will allow us to have a much better interpretation of our regression weights. But it does require that you calculate the mean of the variable. That's easy enough to do in any software package. And then you'll actually go in and create some new variables that are actually the difference between the measured variable and the mean variable. Let's let that sink in. For IV1 and IV2, we have to find out what the mean is for all of our subjects or all of our observations. And then we'll go in and arithmetically create a new term called IV1 mean centered. And that will simply be every subject's score on IV1 will be subtracted from the mean of IV1. We'll do that also for IV2. Well, let's see what some regression output would look like when we use mean centered variables. Here's some regression output that we just looked at. We have the beta weights that are out of range, just a little refresher, way out of range. We still have the appropriate statistical significance. We got a 0.513 total R squared and an overall F score of 42.428. Let's see if those things change on the next few slides. Here, no change. Same R squared, same overall F score. Now, by using a two-way interaction of IV1 that's mean-centered and IV2 that's mean-centered, now we have beta weights within the range of acceptability. It did not affect their statistical significance level. That's a good thing. But you'll notice that in stage one, the IVs are not mean-centered variables. They're just regular variables. But the interaction term is the cross product of a newly created artificial mean-centered IV1 and a newly created artificial mean-centered IV2. Here's some more output just to show you that it really doesn't matter if you mean-center the IVs and use those as your main effect variables. Again, total R squared of 0.513. Overall F score of 42.428. Here in block one of the regression model, we have mean-centered IVs. And in block two, of course, that same old uh, interaction term used in the last one. The regression, the standardized regression coefficients, the beta weights are exactly the same. So the moral of this story is that you mean center variables and then cross multiply them to create your interaction term. But you don't have to use the mean centered variables themselves 
in the multiple regression block one, which is the main effects. Hope that makes sense. If not, we'll go back, take another look. IV1 and 2, not mean centered in model 1 of the bottom table. Model 2 has not mean centered IV1 and IV2 and the cross product of the mean centered versions of IV1 and 2. Here's the next table. Now they're mean centered. Hope you see that in the bottom table there called coefficients. Here we have a mean centered IV and a mean centered IV. And then, of course, the cross product. The beta weights are exactly the same in both of those models. So that's good to know. Well, it's difficult for us to tell whether or not our actual interaction term um, or, or whether we found support for our hypothesis because we really can't tell what a 0.249 beta weight means. Does that mean that high of one and high of the other? What we have to do is we'll have to actually graph these. We can't determine whether or not this is in the direction which was hypothesized. Because remember, our hypotheses say such that high levels of this and high levels of that will lead to the highest levels of y. So we have to graph them. And that's what we're going to cover right here. So graphing interactions, we'll want to put the dependent variable on the vertical y-axis and the independent variable on the horizontal axis. And then since we need to actually create some line segments. Remember those line segments from the previous uh, graph? We'll have to calculate values of the moderator, the other IV that is, on one standard deviation above and below the mean, calculate the values of the IV1, one standard deviation above and below the mean, and then insert these values into the regression equation. So here's the regression equation from that SPSS output. y is equal to 2.708 minus 0.667 IV sub 1 minus 0.333 IV sub 2 plus 0.481 IV1 IV2, that being the cross product there. We'll need to find four different values for these y's. Remember the high on one, low on the other, low on one, high on the other, high on one and the other, low on one and the other. And so if we were to actually do that, we would then calculate one regression equation where the value of IV2 would be inserted one standard deviation above the mean and IV1 one standard deviation below the mean. And the cross product of those values would be the uh, interaction term. And we'd go on and on and on. And we would actually plug and chug into that regression formula. And we would find four dots plotted on our diagram. And we would simply connect the dots. And it might look something like this. Here we would have on the vertical axis, the dependent variable. On the horizontal axis, the independent variable one. The two line segments would be high levels of IV2 and low levels of IV2. And here we see that they are decidedly not parallel. So this is visual evidence of a statistically significant interaction. Now we had um, mathematical evidence in the regression output when we saw that the beta weight was statistically significantly different from zero for the interaction term. Okay, there are some easier ways of actually doing this than just plugging and chugging. There's a variety of different online calculators. Uh, there's a fellow named Jeremy Dawson who's put together uh, a, a lengthy web page with an explanation about um, centering and standardizing variables and two-way and three-way interactions. And he's got some nifty little downloadable Excel spreadsheets that just require you to put in the regression coefficients. And that spreadsheet downloaded here would look something like this. So here you can see that in the yellow, the column B next to independent variable, I've put in negative point 667 and the moderator variable or IV2 is negative 0.333 and the interaction term is 0.481 
and uh, it automatically creates this particular graph. And then you could just cut and paste that into your journal article. So this is a nice little easy thing. You don't have to worry about your own mathematical errors. All right. Let's go back and review what we learned here. We learned that mediation and moderation are very different. Mediation is when some intervening variable is in the middle of two other variables. It serves as a generative mechanism by which the impact of one variable is transmitted to another. Moderation is when some third variable affects the strength of the relationship between two other variables. Very different things. We also learned that hierarchical regression is not the same thing as stepwise regression. Stepwise regression capitalizes on the chance characteristics of a sample. Hierarchical regression is when you enter into different blocks of a regression model, different variables a priori. You know and plan how it is you will enter them. We also learned how to interpret regression output. That was fairly easy. Um, looking at the Model 1 and Model 2, as the SPSS output terms it. We also learned how to compute interaction terms and that they're just simply multiplication. Um, and then I showed you how to mean center variables to offset collinearity, and I showed you the collinearity issues. And you can go back and take a look at that output, and you'll see that the variance inflation factor was way out of line, as was the tolerance, both of which are output in the SPSS. And then I showed you how to uh, graph some interactions uh, using an Excel spreadsheet downloadable from Jeremy Dawson's website. Um, it's a nifty site with all sorts of good, useful inf information. And uh, I hope you've learned a lot from this. And uh, if you have any questions, well, send me an email, uh, brianmillerphd at gmail.com, and I'll be happy to get back to you as quickly as I can and help you out. Thanks.